Happy Grey Cup Sunday, Marshall Ferguson here. I hope that you're having a chance to celebrate the Grey Cup in your own unique way as we are one year away from it making its valiant return to Hamilton, Ontario, which I'm very excited about being around here in the Hammer. Uh, today, I wanted to bring you something special near and dear to me uh, because anytime that you go through any of these books, you're going to see something extremely unique inside of them. There's going to be quarterbacks of the past, there's going to be history, news and notes, but there's also going to be international, 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 all the way down, except for one. Uh, in the top 50 of passing yardage all time, there was only one, and his name is Russ Jackson. And Russ is someone who I got to know thanks to my affiliation with McMaster University in my playing days very, very well, where I would see him around and didn't really understand the history, all the rest. But at the start of the pandemic, I went back and I wanted to watch some old CFL games. I thought, if there's going to be a void without games in 2020, why not take advantage of it and do something creative, do something different, do something that I don't usually have time to be able to accomplish. And for me, that was watching old Grey Cups because I see all the old Grey Cup footage and I don't truly understand it the way that I want to as somebody who has not had the opportunity to go back and watch all these. So I set out on a journey to watch a bunch of old Grey Cups and I did a Grey Cup a day for about a month or two where I was just grinding through the oldest of the old, literally the first television broadcasted games on the CBC way back in the mid-1950s. And I made my way into the 1960s, and I started to realize how many of the important names of that generation, really the origin stories of the Canadian Football League, are unfortunately no longer with us. And we can't carry forward their message and tell what the CFL is really all about, where it was born from, and what it means to be a fan of the Canadian Football League following all these great players. And so I decided to reach out to Russ Jackson. And thankfully for me, he lives in Hamilton. I live in Hamilton. And he agreed to come and sit down with me. He is an incredible gentleman. He is a nicer man than he ever was a player. And he was one hell of a player. Because if you watch some of the clips of him in his playing days, you take that across all generations and it still applies. And so I wanted to sit down with him and just talk about some X's and O's and some real true football stuff. Because Russ, at 84 years young, is still as sharp as they come when dealing with all things football because he is a football guy at heart and so I wanted to bring that to you. If you want a more conversational piece then of course you can click on the link that's in the description of this video. It's actually an hour and 45 minute audio podcast that we did on the same day. Uh, this one a little bit more football, a little bit more visual and I hope it gives you the same jitters that it did me being able to listen to a lifeline to the CFL's past describe his iconic career. Enjoy. Russ, but first and foremost, thank you for uh, for taking the time. Well, I enjoy it. It's kind of nice to be able to talk about what happened oh, yeah. years ago, 60 years ago. So we'll just go to it and have fun. So the first thing I want to bring up here is uh, is the first picture that Mark DeNoble from the Canadian Football Hall of Fame was nice enough to send to me. And that is uh, you wearing number 82. Now explain to me, did you get to pick 82? Where did 82 come from? Were there other options? When you were first in the CFL, 58, 59, how did that work? Well, when I first came to Ottawa, I was just a young Canadian. It wasn't even, I don't think, thought I was going to make the team in yeah. those days, coming from a small university to McMaster. And uh, I just, uh, first exhibition game, I walked in and number 82 was in my locker. <laughs> I had no choice or anything, that was it. So I started to work. So we make our way from 82 and, uh, and we go right to 1960 here, or I want to show, th this amazed me, your very first play ever in a Grey Cup. You end up setting these records in Grey Cups and playing in 60 and 66 and 68, 69, but the first snap ever, and this told me everything I need to know about Russ Jackson as a football player. First snap, take a snap, rolled out, got cave on it in front of you, and then just taken off. Uh, you played with a fearless nature, even in your very first snap of a great cup ever, it felt like the moment wasn't too big for you. And as somebody played quarterback, that takes a lot of guts. I know it's not your first game ever, but in that situation, that scenario, what was it that allows you to just, was that a call run? Are you bootlegging on your own? I mean, it, it just jumped out to me. Well, I just called the plays. I called all my own plays. Never from the first day I was there in 1958 did Frank Clare call any plays. But uh, I just walked in and I'd been in and out and so on, and uh, of the playoff games with Ronnie Lancaster, yeah. that was the year of the two quarterback system. And uh, I just decided uh, time to run the ball, and the field was terrible. It was yeah. a terrible, muddy field. But uh, it was there, and we had a great offensive line. So that to me was the way to get the ball moving, and uh, running with the ball was uh, kind of 
second nature to me, especially after playing at McMaster. Go along here, the next one, it's uh, down the goal line, looks like. And yep, here's all I, this is, I pulled this one as one of your, uh, <laughs> it didn't end up in a, in a touchdown for you, but I, I just love this, being able to set, pause, and then flip away from everything. Where did the shake come from? How's a, how's a kid from Westdale have the shake that just I, naturally develops? I don't know, I just think it was part of me. I. I was a running quarterback, so that, that it didn't bother me to have to turn away from other players, defensive players, and whatever was behind me, I didn't know all the time exactly where everybody on defense was, and you'll, you'll go if you ever go that far to one of the touchdowns in the 69 Great Cup game, and I'm heading to roll out to the right, and all of a sudden there's nothing there. I turn around and come back and don't know, and I do get a little bit of time and throw a touchdown pass to Jim Mankins, the fullback, yeah. in the end zone. So it was, it was just something I did, uh, and I mean I got cracked a few times too when I turned around. So uh, we'll get there. Don't worry. <laughs> I got a couple of good ones in here from some abuse that you took, but I grabbed this one too, which it goes down as a sack. But to be able to, you know, guy goes over the top of your back, you shake another one. And this is, I believe, in the 68. Probably Calgary. Say, yeah, that was Calgary. But I just love that clip so much because it just refused to go down and making moves off of guys over and over. And it felt like the entire Calgary defense was repeatedly just, they were stuck in their trashes and were going, shouldn't this guy be down already? Well, he should be, but uh, <laughs> you get lucky every once in a while. Spin off a couple of those. So jump to this one. Uh, this is the end of 1960. So. I got, I got a couple of questions about the end of 1960 years. Uh, we end up having a fan come on the field and ends up running away with the football. Now, I got to tell you, I've watched all the great cops beginning from the television broadcast in 1954. And as I make my way through them, there's some pretty amazing things that were trends in the old days, which was the field access, obviously, and yeah. people storming the field and all the rest. But So this ball gets stolen. And you end up seeing the fan run away, and I, I'm thinking to myself immediately, which by the way, I was trying to figure out if that guy had a Ticat logo on the back of his jacket. I don't know if, I don't know if you got a good look at the back of his jacket there as he's running off the field, but, um, but I love being able to think, okay, so that guy somehow runs away with the ball, and they're not sure what to do, and obviously there's the deliberation, and everybody's talking, and making it over, and the fans are all out there on the field. And at this point, you're thinking, what? Yeah, well, I, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> He didn't have another football, I guess. That was the thing. And he couldn't just give us a football. But by the time the fans were all on the field, you knew they weren't going to get them cleared. Yeah. So you knew the game was going to be over. But it was kind of a strange situation. There were lots of them in those days. But uh, the fans get in and tearing down the goalposts, just like at universities, was uh, a popular thing to do in the CFL. So are you standing in the huddle at this point as people are starting to well, leak into the field and you're kind of looking at your guys going, well, so what are you guys going to happen? Yeah. Like, <laughs> What is going to happen? Is it over? Are we going to have to go to the dressing room and have them clear the people off the field and try and find a football? Or yes. What? I don't know, but uh, it was there were some strange happenings in those days because you didn't have the security and all those things that were going on. I can remember walking off the field in my first year with one of our running backs, Bobby Judd, and Bobby was a, a runner, and we'd had a game where he couldn't get, you know, past the line of scrimmage. And we're walking off the field, and I'm not too far from him. And some fan, they're all come on the field, and some fan walks up. He says, "Well, Bobby, Chad, when are you gonna explode?" He said, "Right now," and <laughs> laid the guy out on the field. <laughs> it was, but those were things that happened. They were part of the game, part of the, the afternoon's entertainment. Yeah, it was all part and parcel with the way that the games used to uh, go down. So this is, you know, fans tearing down the goalposts and whatnot, and they're trying to figure out what's gonna happen here on the field. But this is what I really wanted to ask you about. So this is when they actually call it, right? And you mm -hmm. see the official. You come flying in. Now, how, how quickly did you know I have to save the game ball? Well, I just sort of knew that it was over. It was instinct? This was 60, and Ottawa hadn't won a great cup for a long time, and Frank Clare had been, you know, belittled by the press and so on that they couldn't win the big one. And uh, we just wanted to, to take it and give it to them. And, it was a big day for him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the football gets placed into your hands, and now you go shaking hands, and it seems like quickly right about here you realize, <laughs> oh, here comes a massive here crowd. Comes the fans. And you yeah. felt this guy that comes up behind you and tries to punch the ball out from underneath. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure you felt that the ball pops a little bit. You turn around and say, what? Well, I'm just trying to get <laughs> onto the ball and get off the field, and if there's a 
police officer there, as you can see. Oh, yeah, there is a police officer. I didn't actually see he's that. He's sort of going to help me a little bit, I think. Okay, so did he help your great escape off of the field? Because I was wondering, when they go to the wide shot here on CBC, how do you get out of that? When you have I don't the remember. football. I just, I just think all I was doing was protecting the football, trying to get out of there and hope no one, you know, takes a shot at me. Amazing. I, uh, I That was... The biggest question I think I had for you, going through all these old games, was how in the heck did you get off the field with the football? And, and even that officer looks like he's getting bounced around pretty good by the time <laughs> yeah. that the crowd all gets out there, right? Oh, yeah. run, but was, that was after, that's what it was like after the games. People just swarmed onto the field. I uh, jump forward here, and I think we are looking at, uh, is this 66 now against Saskatchewan? And uh, I want to ask you about some of your favorite throws, just in terms of the routes that you would throw, because obviously the option and the way that you would roll, the corner was so, so effective for you for the majority, if not the entirety of your career, including big plays like this one. Yeah, well, it was, we always had, right from the first year, well, after the first couple of years when Bobby Simpson and Bill Sawalski were the ends, but... We always had speed. Frank, the head coach, Frank Clair, liked to have speed. And I was fortunate to have Whit Tucker and Margie Atkins and then uh, Washington out of the halfback spot with great speed. And, and defenses knew they had to stop this. And uh, I think that helped us, even though they didn't score touchdowns in the last game, the 69 Great Cup, I'm convinced that Saskatchewan had lined up to stop our deep throwing game. Yep. And that's why, when you think about it, four guys scored touchdowns in that 69 Great Cup game. And if you asked any fan, who were they? Yeah. They wouldn't pick Jay Roberts, the tight end, <laughs> Jim Mankins, the fullback, and Stewie, who caught two short passes but ran 50 yards after he caught them downfield because those guys were taking all the defensive backs out of the picture. Yeah. They're running it all vertical. And we had great, as I say, the speed was important to us. And we threw a lot of long passes, too. Yeah. And I enjoyed it. But the speed helped the rest of the offense. Oh, my God. Oh, I pulled this one just because of how difficult a throw this is. Uh, and I, I know you talk a lot about the vertical passing that you guys had and being able to mix and match. And this is kind of a typical setup for me from what I've seen from these great cup games that I've watched. But this is such a tough throw for us, like from basically the middle of the field. But you're getting smacked, yeah. and, and you know you're getting smacked the entire time, right? As you're setting, I mean, you're you're pumping. I know, right there. You're pumping as a man is free rushing because the block has been missed yeah. downfield here, right? So, and then you load it up, and you're basically throwing middle of the field for 10, 15, about 23 yards, pinpoint to the sideline. I mean, that's a crazy throw. It doesn't matter what area you play, which is honestly one of the things I love most about watching your games is that you can take moments like that. And you can compare them against, it doesn't matter, Mike Riley, Bo Levi, Mitchell, Henry Burris, anybody. And it still applies. Yeah. It's the exact same difficulty, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's the same difficulty for sure. But the defenses were more readable, I think, in those days. They weren't as complicated in the various combinations. And it was late in my career that teams started to play a combination of zone and man-to-man -man out there. And that became a little bit more difficult to, to read. But basically, through most of my career, it was either zone or man to man, and the only thing I was really worried about reading was are they going to blitz? Yeah, you know, and, and teams started to blitz out of zones, and you know they tried to as we had success, they tried to make a few little changes that uh, would help them defensively, Absolutely. and that that weren't you know normal as I say like blitzing out of a zone. Right. Was new. First time that happens, you're going okay. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> Whoops, better check that one out. <laughs> I do. Uh, I do love the idea of yeah. There's zone. There's man. It's easier to read. But if you get man to man and you're running a half roll, 23 yard comeback. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that. I love that. I love that so much in this one. To be able to make that. Play along see, that's where the speed of Tucker. Right. And he's got a linebacker on him. Yeah, he's got 50. 50 there, yeah. So it, it's uh, just got to get rid of it. Go he'll get it. And then this one, I'm sure memorable for a lot of reasons, but create a little bit of time, get away, load it up, and again, there's Tucker for you, yeah. down the left side. What do you remember of that play? Not very much. Yeah. It's just one that uh, rolled out to the left, and it gave him plenty of time to put the pressure on the defensive back. A little bit of instinct. Now, this one I pulled because I've... Uh, 
I wanted to show that running was a hazard, Russ. Uh, I'm sure you've taken a couple, but this, with four guys piling in over the top in 1966, uh, man, running as a quarterback used to do a lot of it, and I think there used to be more of it than there is now because quarterbacks are so protected, but yeah. the beatings I'm sure that you took, the days after taking hits like this with four guys jumping over the top of you, hitting you up high, all the rest, uh, what, what do you think when you watch clips like this versus, of course, what we're used to watching today? Well, I, it was just part of my game. Yeah. I mean, I ran from <clears throat> playing high school ball at Westdale and uh, then going to Mac. And uh, it was, you, you took the hits. I mean, I wore the same helmet. I've got that, that helmet in Ottawa. I didn't know where it went. A lot of people said they've got my helmet. You know, every Hall of Fame has got my helmet. <laughs> but uh, I forgot where it actually ended up. But when we had our reunion last year, the uh, mayor of Ottawa produced it for me wow. and said, here it is, but he wouldn't give it to me. Yeah, yeah. Have it. But I wore, <coughs> excuse me, the same helmet for 12 years. They wanted me to wow. get better and better, but it was just a shell. That's yeah. all it was. And I took a few bops on the head. I played second halves of games where I'd been knocked out by yeah. that in the first half. But you went in, learned the plays at halftime, and ran the offense. Crazy. It was just the way it was in those days. Absolutely. And then this is the, the isolated slow. This is the first time we got an isolated slow-mo shot, I think, in the history of the CFL of Russ Jackson getting obliterated uh, by a bunch of <laughs> Saskatchewan Rough Riders on this one. It was when they first brought in the slow-mo, uh, and that was, again, another one where I was looking at it. I'm just like, man, that is, it is different. I'm sure it uh, brings back. Now I want to ask you about that helmet, uh, because you said it's the same one. It looks like it's the exact same helmet with the same paint job. Like they never touched it up. They, they, they did occasionally, did they? but okay. not very often. It, it, was, had, it had a lot of bumps, and it was welded together inside because it had been cracked around the, the earpiece. And there's a that's why I knew it was the original helmet. When I look at it, you fact checked when the man inside, ended it to you. Just look inside. <laughs> look for this welded piece inside the helmet and say that's the original. That one there in the Hall of Fame is not the original helmet of mine. Amazing. It was somebody painted it up and, and made out that it was, but it was, uh, it took a beating. I mean, we didn't have the best helmets in those days. They aren't like they are now, didn't have the air helmet or the, any of the concussion type. And if you took a hit on the head, you knew you'd been hit. I just, uh, I, I, I knew that the helmets would be beat up, but when I saw this shot from the CBC broadcast in 66, I said, that looks like a helmet that's been worn for 10 years. That, that <laughs> hasn't been, been touched worn, right? It got worn right through, but every year at training camp, they'd want me to go get a new helmet. But I said, no, I'm going to wear my own. So you actually turned it down because you liked the, the way that you had it, the, the helmet that you had? Yeah, it, yeah, I liked the way it fit, everything else, like the shoulder pads. I got the shoulder pads there. I wore the same little set of shoulder pads yeah. for my entire career. The same thing, go get some new shoulder pads. But no, I sort of worked on the pads on the right side for throwing for me. They were comfortable. I didn't want any changes. I didn't need changes. I didn't need a new pair of shoulder pads. Yeah. Oh, I was, Frank. yeah, I wanted to grab a clip of Frank Clare here just to talk for a second about him and the fact that you guys were together for the extent of uh, your I journey, yeah, throughout all of it. The same year I did. It's it's amazing to be able to think that the two of you were paired together essentially throughout that era. And, and the uh, interesting thing was, excuse me, but the interesting thing was, he never called the play. Like he left me to do it. I'm glad there weren't timeouts in those days. He didn't have to come to the sideline and so on. And yeah. like he just let me go and run it and never did send in plays or when I come to the sideline and say, well, maybe we should try this or do that. He just left me to run the team on game day, wow. which was a real treat for me. You know, I I knew, and I really think even today, like, you know, say Stewie's running with the ball and he takes a real crap. Yeah. Well, I know when he comes back to the huddle, I can't involve Stewie in the next play. Whereas the guy up in the press box, he doesn't know that Stewart's half bumped or whatever. Or if I get hit, I know I better not be doing anything. Just I better just hand off and yeah. get the next play and try and get my head back together. So I mean, I I like that. I often wonder how I would react if someone else was telling me what to do. Mm -hmm. And everybody I say that to, every quarterback today who just goes through this right from high school through university and everything. The plays are being called, they don't think of all other than maybe the occasional change of the line. 
but I don't know how to react. But the quarterbacks of today that I say that to say, if you're brought up that way, that's just the way right. we play the game now, and, and you would react to it. But certainly gives you I greater control and understanding of, of what you're trying to accomplish. Right? But as I say, you, you know who's hurt. You know if an offensive lineman has been, you know, beaten up that yeah. last play. Well, don't depend on him this next play. It takes a pretty amazing aware of, uh, amount of awareness, I'd say, too. This, this one I'd love to grab because, as I say, there's Stuart hanging out with you in 11, just off to the side. And you're drawing up something, literally looks like you're drawing it up in the dirt. And then Stuart basically at the last second here in this huddle kind of takes a step forwards towards you and says something to you on the way out, right, to be able yeah. to communicate. I'm sure by now you already know what play this is, but yeah. this one I'm imagining uh, Frank Clare is glad he didn't draw it up. Uh, but it's the handoff, reverse, flip it back to you. And you know how this one ends. Yeah. <laughs> Badly. <laughs> uh, and that I, I thought was just so interesting, not just because it was creative and different, and, but just the interaction between you and Stuart in the huddle there at the last second, diving in and trying to get clarification, maybe making a suggestion, whatever You're it was. Talking. I'm going to throw them all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lean in. Is that what you said? Lean in. No, so, I, I was going to say. It. It. That'd be about what he would be thinking because he couldn't throw the ball very well. <laughs> yeah, that one got hung up on you. Uh, and then this is the other one that I had that was uh, Russ Jackson, the option quarterback here, trying to decide what to do with this end. Flying upfield, you're like, I'll go underneath, ah, just kidding, dump it backwards, the old two-handed spike overhead. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, that's such a tough play to run in the air because it seems like now, you know, when you're watching quarterbacks deal with defensive ends, it's repetition and it's, mm -hmm. there's certain ways that defensive ends will play it and you're schooled in the ways to handle all the different types of it's so specified, but it feels like at this point, you know, it was it was a little bit barn doors open and seeing yeah. what you could create offensively playing off of a man, right? Yeah, but it was a little different. But that was my type of football was yeah. running the ball and uh, put a lot of pressure on the defenses. This one, and, and the, the quick cut we had, which was oh yeah, important to our offense too. We. Got many on offsides for first Yeah, downs. I was going to ask about that actually. The pace that you guys played with at the line of scrimmage, it forced teams to, as soon as you got under center, just jump. Yeah. Right? Because they just assumed it. So I imagine that you kind of played off of that a lot. Yeah, well, we, and any second and two or three, we'd go on a quick count, maybe the first quick or second quick, occasionally the third. But, you know, we'd get offsides almost 95% of the time, the other team would jump off. Because they had to be ready, they just were standing there, and then we, the line had come running out of the huddle. This one uh, I love so much because it's Stuart giving you a nice little block on the bottom here. Oh yeah. He tees off on a guy for it, and you scramble away and pick up a nice 15-yard game before they pile on. But the uh, the replay of this one again, just enjoying getting out, setting up, and taking off on guys, getting that running style that so many fans remember. Enjoy. This one I, I pulled because, I mean, you did this a thousand times in your career, obviously, but the idea now of taking a snap from under center, which you know is rare enough by itself, taking a snap from under center, turning your back to the defense, mm -hmm. right, and not for the purpose of a ball fake or a, a run or anything like that, but just turning your back, having your offensive guards pulling to go and protect you, turning their back at times to the defense, as you spin and turn, I mean, there's so many quarterbacks now that their coach would say, hey, I need you to turn your back just to be able to get the angle and start rolling out here. And they'd say, you want what? Yeah. Right? I mean, it's it's something that now is kind of laughable, but back then that was the norm for you. And I'm just, I'm amazed by your comfort when I go back and watch these old great cups of being able to just turn blindly and get out and trust that you're, you're going to have the space and the time to operate. Yeah, but the guys would, let, if they got beat completely, they would let me know. I mean... We played games where we didn't have taxi squads like they do now, and you'd go those double headers out west, and guy get hurt in the first game, and two days later you got to play another football game and fly to it. In that time, fly to a different city, and we played with a fullback who was completely knee torn completely, drank a bottle of booze between the two <laughs> games, but I mean. He played that second game, and all we did the whole game, the team walked off the field with him, walked on the field with him so he didn't stand out. 
We played the whole game where I rolled right or rolled left, oh, wow. and he went to the back side. And all his responsibility was, if somebody came from the back side, he yelled, look out, Russ. Really? And I knew I had to get rid of the ball or run with it because he was coming. Somebody, he couldn't block anybody, he couldn't move. And we played a whole game and won a game where the fullback was absolutely just a person standing yeah. there. And he turned to the back side, I rolled right. He turned to the back side on the left. So oh, if somebody came on the back side, he yelled, and I knew, get rid of the ball or just keep running, no matter what's out there. That's the way it has to be. So the natural follow-up is how many times in that game that you won did you get the lookout call? Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a few. But, but it's just a matter of, um, that's the way the game was played. Yeah. Like, I mean, it was, you, you knew what was there. But it was, uh, well, there's Ernie up again. <laughs> so this one I grabbed because I'm going through and I watched the 66 Grey Cup and then I see afterwards you step up for the interview and uh, I also love that you addressed Ernie at the start of every answer, which was wonderful, but uh, to be able to step up, and I'm like, wait a minute, Russ is huge. I'm like, what is going on with these arms yeah, back in 1966? Great. Man, yeah. that, what was the workout program like for a 1966 Russ Jackson? I, I worked out before training camp quite a bit. I ran a lot, and I did a, 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 some workouts, but I... Um, I ran a lot because during training camp, once we got that far, I didn't do any running. I didn't. Yep. I didn't do the sprints and the stuff that all the other guys did. I was standing on the sled yelling numbers or something, <laughs> taking a ride. And so I did a lot of running. I used to take my kids out with me, and we'd run the, the back area in, in the mornings. But I worked out a bit. But I grew that way. I didn't put a whole lot of muscle on. I was always a big stocky kid. Yeah. You know, from when I was young, I was I was stocky. I had big arms and back, shoulders and that. So it was not, that was that just an example of us. Yeah, the, exactly. I also love the uh, the evolution now to the, you know, the slick, dry fit, everything has to be well, perfect underneath the uniform. You're like, give me a ripped off white t-shirt. Yeah, I don't okay, give a damn. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, all right, so we go from there. That was '66. So that was the loss in '66. And we jump to yeah. jump to '60. And this again, just like the first play of your first ever breakup in 1960. I love this because this is the first play in 1968, right? Yeah. Eight, eight years later, it's the first play of a game, and it's the same, just aggression downfield, deep throwing. Um, how much do you wish you cashed in on this one? Because man, it was close. Yeah, it was close. It was Margie. They did a good job defensively. The team started to, late in my career, really try and take away the deep stuff, as I mentioned that once before. Yeah. And I, I personally, and, and we as a team, didn't throw the short stuff enough. And as I mentioned in the, the 69 Great Cup, the, all the passes weren't very long in terms of touchdowns. And people would be surprised to say that, well, Wick didn't have a touchdown of the four, or right. Margene didn't have one. But teams started to really concentrate on trying to take away the deep stuff. And as I look back, Frank and myself, as, as we set the, the game plans up, didn't take advantage of that as much as we should have. Mm. We should have been throwing to the tight ends and the halfbacks a little bit more. Mm. But we were, we were still winning, throwing them all deep. I mean, I yeah. mean, so you, take your chances, right? You, you take a chance, you miss two, but you get one, and all of a sudden you're got seven points on the board. No doubt. And that was very much the story of this 68 Great Cup was a couple of the big plays that you guys made and mm -hmm. grabbed this one. Just again, it's the same idea as before. I love the just the, the arm strength and the accuracy and everything, being able to get it out to the sideline is amazing to be able to see to compare with some of the older. Now this one I wanted to ask you about because I know the defensive back originally, we'll talk about that maybe later on on the, on the podcast, the radio side of things, but um, there were so many players in this area, as you know, obviously, that played both ways and that handled a variety of responsibilities. And um, for you, I want to know who was better, quarterback Russ Jackson or field goal holder Russ Jackson? <laughs> because well, that is smooth right there. Well, I did it all. By, well, I kicked it at McMaster. I, I kicked the field goals and the, the converts and yep. so on. And it wasn't until I went to the pros that... I was just told you hold the ball, and so it's just something I developed at, the, at that time. And it's, it's, 
I don't know, I, I held for a lot of kickers through the, the 12 years. Sudsy was the last one. Yeah. But uh, it now, was just something that I learned to do. I had good hands, and Frank said, you're going to hold. Okay. The downside, I guess, is that if there's a missed field goal, you got to go cover. Yeah. Uh, what, what are the coverage skills like? I played defense. Yeah. At, at Chase I played down. both ways, yeah. and I played the same in Westdale. So I don't, defensively, I didn't mind. I actually went to pro. In the first few games, I played defensive halfback because yeah. they were looking at me as a halfback rather than a, a quarterback until one of the exhibition games against BC when I got put in and I took the team from the two-yard two -yard line downfield for a touchdown. And Frank came in and said, at that time, there was talk I was going to be traded to Hamilton for the rights to Ronnie Stewart. Hmm. Who, Hamilton had got the rights from Montreal, who drafted him originally out of Queens. And, uh, I came to the dressing room and after that came and Frank wandered over and said, there's going to be no trade. In other words, you're, you're staying here, you're not going to get traded. So if you, were, if you were stuck as a defensive back, you could have been a tight cap. No, but when you got the opportunity. Yeah, I, would never, I don't think I ever would have got the chance to play quarterback in Hamilton. Just because Bernie Floney and, and Bernie was here. Yeah. Zuger was sitting there waiting. Yeah. So I mean, it was just one of those things, the way it, everything worked out. The, mm -hmm. I mean, there were lots of talk about trades and not staying around and so on, but uh, it worked out and then part of the job was old the field goal. Did you ever have a, a trade offer from when you were any time between 60 and 69? Like once you were established and you're the guy after the two quarterback year with Ryan Lancaster, was there ever a, hey, we can maximize Russ's value? Did you ever hear anything? Never about heard that? anything about a trade that time. Yeah. I, the only time I heard about a possible trade was not trade, but when I, after I retired a couple of years, that you know a couple of teams were interested in getting my rights yeah. to see if they could talk me into coming back and playing football. But mm, none of that went through. Here we come on one of the quick counts. Yeah. So this is. So how can you tell it's a quick count before you even get to the ball? Is it just because you've got your it's center just, set? I watch the, the line. They're yeah. they're they're getting up there and they're not really <laughs> quite as fast. <laughs> and everybody's getting in position and the and the wideouts. Are getting out a little faster. Everybody's moving a little faster, and the defense finally realizes, you know, after you watch it a couple times on film, you can tell the difference between a quick count and a, and a regular count. I know? find it interesting too for people that like don't appreciate maybe the the smaller moments of this, but the center sets, the end gets out first, and it's basically guard tackle, guard tackle, boom, right, and then you're just off to the races. Yeah, and you'll notice my jeep doesn't go as wide as maybe he might. He's just right. going to the numbers because he's got to get to the line of scrimmage. Yeah. I've got to make sure he's at the line, otherwise we get called for an illegal formation. Whereas Tucker, he can wander a bit because he's the flanker. Yeah. He can stay off the line. Yeah, you've got the end. I was about to say that you know, maybe the, one of the more legendary plays of the uh, 68 Great Cup was an illegal formation, but you got an end on the line, so you're good. Yeah. <laughs> But, so this is what I wanted to ask you about this, of course, with Washington's big run here in 68 is you toss it, it's on the money, right? It's in a good spot, bobbles. Your mind at that point is where? I just think, well, we got to go back and run another play. I <laughs> thought we're, you know, he's going to fall on it and we'll gain a yard or lose a yard, but not a touchdown. Some of the greatest plays that we have as quarterbacks uh, is as a spectator, right? Like sometimes you make the great throw and you love it, but sometimes the people around us do incredible things oh, that, sure. that you can never imagine. And I, that happen, yeah. I just imagine your emotions watching the hop and right about there, probably figuring out what was actually happening and how far he was going to be able to go on this run. When people talk about it, they make it sound easier, but Vic did a great job. There are three guys had a shot at him, one, two, three, and did a good job of zigging and zagging to get through there before he took off down the field for the last 50 yards. And that's still the longest running touchdown, I think, that's in crazy. It is, great yeah. history. It is, absolutely. That was a special play. This one. Well, half all, this is the backside long throw touchdown. Yeah. This is that, a beautiful throw, Russ. That was a play that uh, we had looked at and uh, because the defense, when Frank and I were watching the, the, the game film against, against Calgary, we noticed that um, when we went into that sort of semi rollout, that, and we had three wide, wide guys out here, we put Tucker and Atkins on the same side, and Washington was there. So 
when we put the three fast guys out on that wide side of the formation, we, we realized that they, Stewie and Jay Roberts, were split out to the left. And we started to realize that we saw it a couple times. We don't run that formation that often. But Calgary would play Stewie, and Stewie had lost a bit of his speed by that time of his career, and Jay, they'd play a man-to-man, -man, the two there. And then they'd try and play zone over here. Oh, okay. And Jerry Keeling, who was the inside halfback, he was actually over on the other side of the field. And, you know, Frank said, you know, if we can get something that shows a bit of a rollout and get Jerry moving a bit, there's nothing in behind him uh -huh. because these two guys, Jay and Stewie, were going to run like six or seven yard outs and bring the two guys on the right side of the field the and he's got the whole side of the field and it wasn't even on the game sheet. I just, we ran it about three or four times in practice that week and I just said to the guys in the huddle, that play we ran, and there's Keeling chasing him now. Yeah. But all that, see the open field in behind there. There's no other halfback. But there are two of them up there with Stewie and... Uh, up to the top you're saying there? That, no, at this bottom oh, part the of bottom the formation. Yeah. Oh, let's see. Stewie and about. Roberts are, are there. But the thing was that uh, it, it wasn't there. I just decided this is a great spot on the field. You know, you get these feelings. I yeah. uh, there was a quote about, yeah. this is a time for that play that we've only run about three times, <laughs> and told them. Now, the, the blocking in that was the same as we would do normally, but the right. formation and responsibilities of everybody. Amazing. And he just got that full flight. That's Keeling. So, so between Washington's big run and, and that home run Those shot, two. I what mean, the big plays, yeah, yeah, you guys absolutely and hit home runs throughout yeah. 68. They had the great team that year with Lisk and yeah. At that quarterback and so on, but it was it was interesting that it, the way the play happened and uh, how things come to your mind like that. Yeah. Like why it came to my mind at that stage of the game, I have no idea. When you put in that much work, I guess in preparation, like you can still recount the formation and the alignment. I mean that that game we're talking '68 is like you say more than 50 years ago, mm -hmm. and you're still going, yeah, drag two down, man in the front zone on the back side, and they would chase down and yeah. like when you put that much work into it though, that's how you get that feeling, isn't it? Just knowing and having that understanding. But see, I had that responsibility yeah. all my all my career. I, that was, I, I wasn't waiting for someone to call a play and what am I gonna do with it or whatever. It's, I did what I felt was right and that makes those decisions and things you do, they didn't all work, um, easier. Yeah. I'm sure I could look back and figure out a few that didn't quite work that way, but that yeah. one didn't. It was in the, that that put us ahead enough points that we felt comfortable at you know in the lead in the game Absolutely. with Lisk and Evanshin. This uh, this one I love because when I first watched it through, right, you got the same ball fake in the backfield as you did on the first play of the game. So you got kind of this like you know double A gap, whether it's fullback, splitbacks, whatever here. And then when I first watched it, I thought, oh man, Russ made a heck of a move, and he didn't even know where that end was rushing from. And then I watched it back and went, oh, that's your guard. I uh, was trying to, <laughs> to come over and help a little bit, but yeah. getting stuck in the mud. That's a heck of a save by him coming over and being able to give you an extra yeah. second or two here. And I can't see the number on it's that. Bergerix, I think. Is it? Yeah, 51, yeah. looks like. Bergerix. Um Shoot, he's on the right side, and Bergerix will be on the left side. So um, that'd be Bergerix coming back. Bergerix comes back and bails you out a little bit, but you spin away from it. And then I love the finish of this clip, too. Is running away from three, four, five stampeders, and then the old favorite, running onto the track. Uh, <laughs> and all of a sudden you're on the cleats, and your knees go straight because you know if you bend them, you're going to end up bailing out and flying backwards. So you lock out the legs pretty good here and go skating right into the front row and say hello to a couple of fans, which I'm sure made their great cup oh, yeah, very yeah. special. Uh, love that clip. And then this was the other, because you guys ran so much of this option rollout stuff, I, I wanted to ask you, you talked about teams adjusting against it. Uh, being able to send edge pressure felt like something that teams started to kind of counter. Did you see more and more of this as your career went on? Oh, yeah. 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 But they they knew we were looking to go deep, and they, they had a time to come in and get us. But uh, And they did occasionally. But as I say, we could have, I think, even had more success offensively 
if we had gone to a short game package mm -hmm. throwing the ball, but we didn't do that. We didn't think <laughs> we had to, I guess. And these were the final stats in 68. 14 first down. I was, I was, so I was amazed by this because I see 400 yards passing for Calgary. Yeah. I see five fumbles lost. If you're going to show me this box score as somebody who works in the media now and covers the Canadian Football yeah. League, I'm going to say, oh my goodness, Russ and Ottawa just got That's obliterated, right? right? Mm -hmm. But you really look back at So how were you able to pull this off? I mean, was it just those two big plays? Two big plays, but the defense uh, in the second half, a lot of that offense was... For Calgary was in the first half and they dominated and uh, then we sort of started to turn things around a little bit Well, the two big plays were good but we we started to have a little bit more defense and offense started to move the ball a little bit a lot of our offense was in the second half yeah. you know that's the it, it's amazing how stats sometimes just don't do the job for you. No doubt. There's my shoulder pads. I was going to say, so I wanted to finish off with the old shoulder pads here. In the uh, So these guys, I, I love the, uh, first of all, I love that you're still out of breath. I don't know if it's because you were celebrating so hard in the locker room, but uh, being down there and getting interviewed by CBC after winning in 68 against Calgary, uh, I've never heard you so happy. In all the clips and all the things that exist of your playing days online, on YouTube, all the rest, I've gone through a ton of them. This felt like it was one of your happiest moments. Maybe it was the comeback. I don't know. What was it about this I think this it moment? was a lot of it was that we had taken a lot of criticism over the last few years from the media and the fans in Ottawa. Like we won the 60 great cup. You know, again, Kayvon falling on a, uh, a fumble and so on. But we'd taken a lot of criticism and then we lost to Saskatchewan in 66. And then 67, the Gary Cup game was in Ottawa, and we thought we wanted to be there. We didn't get there, Hamilton, Clover, Saskatchewan in that game in 67. And then we went in 68 and 69, which made it terrific. But this was sort of a climax of quite a few years where we were not well liked in the city of Ottawa as a team. And I guess that might be part of why I was so happy that we had finally broken through that barrier and, uh, and, and won a great cup game. And that frustration, I'm sure, because the Ticats teams basically from when you're there in 60 until, you know, 61, 2, 3, 4, 5, you make it through in 6, you lose 7. This is the breakthrough, right? That, yeah. That's the moment. Yeah. That's the one this, that really This helped. was the breakthrough because, as I say, we were taking a whole lot of criticism over, you know, not just that year, over five or six years. Yeah and so on, and we finally broke through and, and got it, so. And then the last one I got for you here is uh, just the photo of 69 and uh, final game ever, and you and Trudeau and everything that, there. that happened that day is Take amazing. Yep. And that's yep. the, the 69, but the thing that, about that whole year in 69, I just, you know, I'd announced that I was going to return. I told Frank Clara, because I mean, we just went to training camp, and I was going to be the quarterback, and who was going to be the backup quarterback, and they better be able to play defensive back or something. Yeah. And I told him, I said, I'll let you know a year in advance when I'm going to go. So, and, and he, you know, he trusted me after so many years, and well, he gave me the whole offense to run. But I mean, I told him, you know, before training camp started in '69, I said, this is it. Lois and I have talked about it, and it's time for me to get out. Yeah. And uh, that. That was it, and yeah. it was a real tough last three or four weeks that year because and I can never believe when I look back at it, they let Ottawa have a rush Jackson day on the second game of the two-point final against the Argonauts. <laughs> like, I mean, who does that? Like, I mean, it's crazy. So what did Rush Jackson day involve? <laughs> let, let's do Rush Jackson day next year yeah, or something, yeah. but not... The second game of the final it was against Toronto. And Toronto had beaten us by about six or seven points in Toronto the previous so week. So you're coming home with the pressure to win. Coming home with the that. pressure of winning. It's going to be Rush Jackson Day and all week. It's like hell bent for leather. And uh, we were losing at half time. And then we went on and just whipped, whipped them. And I give the guys a lot of credit for that. But at half time, most of half time, I'm spending out on the playing field, the guys are all in the dressing room, I'm there getting presented this and my kids are getting presented this and that. 
And so it was that week and the week before when we went to Toronto and lost by a few points. But then the next week we're in Montreal uh, getting organized for the game and practicing. And there's a lot of talk and a lot of interviews. And then I was up for the two Shenleys. And the, for the Friday, the Thursday night, I had to go and go through all that. And I won the two Shenleys again. And just the, the three or four weeks at the end of my career were just uh, just completely gone, yeah. you know, until after when we won and I figure out, you know, this is, this is it, yeah. you know, and I can remember how sad I felt in the dressing room, mm. that I've been through all that in about three weeks, it seemed like a career, yeah. and it was all positive, yeah. but it was really difficult and to do that, stand there with that. It was great. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, that's what it's all about. Russ, thank you for, for breaking all this junk down with me. Oh, yeah, well, there's no stuff. problem. Yeah, that's it's awesome. funny to look back at it and so on. It, it, it's funny, I was just dragging out all my, trying to figure out who wants the stuff and all the scrapbooks my mother had kept from when I was way back in minor league football, and not football, but minor league baseball and stuff and that. And got a big stack of <laughs> crap books like this and who wants them, who's going to get them yeah. and so on and it was really interesting to sort of look at that and then I looked in a closet in my den and there's all these old films you know of games and specific games and specific plays and probably one of them was the Shenley's for that year but you know it was funny to pull all that stuff out and sort of think my God, that's a long time ago. Yeah. You know, but it was fun. Yeah. <laughs> we had fun. There were times when it wasn't fun, but most of the time it was fun. Yeah. The guys were good, and everybody in Ottawa, other than the stretch we went there without winning the Grim Cup. But it was, uh, I mean, that, that to me was a special moment after 12 years.